Thank you, Paul, for this very nice introduction, and I'll get right started and declare that I have no conflict of interest and actually start out with a background for why my group has worked for more than 10 years looking at mixtures. It actually comes from <clears throat> that the epidemiologist says that we see some warning signals in humans, like reproductive malformations in newborn boys are going up, there are many countries where men have poor semen quality, also in Denmark. Testicular cancer seems to be on the rise. There are some signs of early puberty in girls. Breast cancer seems to be on the rise. And then you can say, what's that got to do with endocrine disruptors? Well, the problem is right now, we actually don't know. But what we know is that if we expose experimental animals to endocrine disruptors during development, we see the same kind of effects. So we wondered how are people protected against endocrine disruptors? And the current practice is that you do a risk assessment based on the animal studies. You decide on a dose without an effect called a node, <coughs> and you compare that to the human exposure. And if the margin of safety is larger than 100, the conclusion is that there is no risk, i.e. this is a safe level for humans. The reason for using this factor of 100 is that there are toxicokinetic differences between, for instance, rats and humans, and also differences in other kinds of sensitivity. Mm. And this kind of risk assessment is done normally for one chemical at a time. But as Paul has also clearly illustrated to you, people are not exposed to one chemical at a time. People are exposed to a chemical cocktail of substances. So we decided we were going to do some research and the questions we would try to give some answer to is, is a mixture effect at nodes for the single endocrine disruptors? Also, can this mixture effect be predicted using dose addition? It's a model based on the dose response data for the single chemicals. Because if that's possible, that would be very useful because it's impossible to test every kind of mixture in animal models. And we also wanted to figure out, is there actually a margin of safety of 100 when we look at human exposure levels, in other words, could there be a risk for the human population based on the experimental studies? Our design of the studies have been the same throughout all of the period. <coughs> we give uh, the substances or the mix to time-mated animals during pregnancy and lactation. We look at a number of endpoints in the pups and we keep some pups for growing up and look at more endpoints at that time point. Uh, some endpoints that we have used a lot is uh, anogenesal distance, which was also mentioned by uh, Paul, and nipple retention. And th that's because they are quite sensitive endpoints for anti-androgenic effect. Richards have also used AGD. Actually, anogenesal distance, it's shown in the picture, it's sort of the difference between this distance in males and female offspring. That's actually what we use for sexing the animals when they are born. <coughs> and this difference is there due to the testosterone action during development. Nipple retention is an equally sensitive endpoint where actually male rats are supposed to have no nipples, female rats have 12, but actually the males start to develop 12 nipples but they are sort of regressed due to the action of testosterone. So if male rats, exposed male rats have nipples, that's an indication that there has been insufficient testosterone during development. In all our studies, all our endpoints are measured blindly to exposure group, and for anogenital and nipple retention, it's the same technician who has done sort of the evaluation in all studies. The first project we actually went into, and this is sort of also a history maybe of some mixture research, was called the Eden Project. It focused on anti-androgens, and it was, the purpose was to make proof of principle. It was, its purpose was not human relevance directly, but proof of principle, which meant that we used a, what you could call a bottom-up approach. 
First we did the dose response for all the single chemicals, then the dose additivity prediction was made based on this formula over here. Then we did the mixture study and then we compared. And this is just to show you an example of data for some of the single substances we used it. It's for three AR antagonists, i.e. three uh, substances with the same mechanism of action. And what you can see here is that for anogenital distance and for nipple retention, we have very nice dose response curves, actually meaning that at the higher doses, the males had similar ATD as the females, and they also had 12 nipples, which was a bit of a problem because then we had to sex them by opening and look at what kind of sex organs are they actually having. And then we did the mixture study. And this is some of the results for anogenital distance. Over here you have the control males, then you have the three single substances, and here you have the mixture result. And as you can see, there's no effect of the single compounds. There's a clear and significant mixture effect. The green here is a prediction, which is quite close to what we saw, and here you have the females. So, for these days, we do see mixture affected null, and they could be predicted by dose addition. We also looked at malformations of the external reproductive organs in the adult male offspring, and that's what's shown here, where actually at the higher doses, we saw a completely split penis, meaning that you could see the os penis in the rats, that in that case, Rats are different from humans, they have a small bone within their penis, which could be sort of called a very marked hypospadia. Actually, in some of the males, we also saw a blind vaginal opening, which obviously a male rat is not supposed to have. To some extent, this is uh, similar to what you can see in humans when you look at hypospadia, but this is a very severe case of that. So we wanted to see what happens when we dose with the mixture. And this uh, graph shows here you have the three single substances and the doses causing this malformation. They do cause this malformation at the higher doses. But within the mixture, when each of the substances was there at a dose that caused no malformations whatsoever, we actually had 60% malformations in the mixture group. Then we continued because these were substances with a similar mechanism of action that we needed to look at antiandrogens that had a dissimilar mechanism of action. And we chose one from the first study, vinclozolin, the AR antagonist, DHP, which is a salate that causes decreased testosterone in male fetuses, finasteride and alpha reductase inhibitor, and prochloras, it's a pesticide and it actually has all of these mechanisms to some extent. And of course, the big question was, are we going to see mixture effect where they have different mechanism of action, and can they be predicted based on dose addition? First, results for anogenital distance, where same kind of figure as before. Here you have the four single substances, and here you have the effect of the mixture. So we actually had a mixture effect at the null for the single substances. Also, here you can see the prediction based on dose addition, very close to the observed results, and over here, sort of to show that we actually did dose response, you can see the results we got, and here you have the prediction curve. So the results were very nicely predicted by dose addition. We also looked, at, uh, of course, at the malformations in this uh, mixture project and what we saw there, and in this case, we had mixed the substances according for their null for causing endocrine disrupting effect. We did not see a mixture effect at the null for the single substances, which is quite nice. On the other hand, at a 10 times null, 100% uh, of the males in the exposed group had these severe malformations. Uh, quite surprising, actually, when we compared sort of the prediction of where we should see uh, the mixture effect, it lies here. 
actually our results are here, which shows that the mixture effect actually occurred at a lower dose than predicted by dose addition, which indicate that we actually see synergism for this endpoint. But that's the only case where we have seen it. Then we continued sort of another approach, going for an environmentally relevant mixture. Uh, not sort of taking seaweed slot, something from the real world, but trying to make a mixture similar to what humans can be exposed to. Meaning that this was a top-down approach which took a mixture of a lot of uh, endocrine disruptors, anti-androgens, that's the blue ones, and some of those called estrogens, the red ones. The mixture ratio we chose was sort of based on high-end human exposure, based on the exposure levels we could find in the literature when we designed the study. Higher end means that we have not chosen the highest dose level we could sort of find, but aiming to be around 90 to 95 percent percentile of human exposure. And the doses we used were 100, 150, 200, and 400, 150 times human exposure. And the main purpose was to find out do we actually, when we have sort of an environmentally relevant mixture, is there a margin of safety of 100? The data for the anogenital distance, or actually the index, it means it's corrected for body weight, shows here you have the total mixture. The blue is the anti-androgens, the red is the estrogens, and out here, given alone, we also had paracetamol. That was included in the total mixture, but not in the submixtures. And what you can see here is that we saw decreased anogenital distance from 200 times human exposure levels. Nipple retention, sort of a similar picture. We also saw effect there, 200 times human exposure levels. But then we looked at the sperm count, and actually what you see here is that we have an effect on sperm count clearly significant from 200 times human exposure level only in the anti-antrogen mixture. But for the total mixture, it seems like there is a decreased sperm count, but the p-values is between 6 to 8 percent, which formally means that it's not statistically significant. So our conclusion is that we do see lower, lower sperm count at 200 and 450 times human exposure, but there may also be good, something going on at 100 times human exposure. Then changing to the females, uh, where we have look, looked at estrocyclicity, we did that when they were young in the females, and we did that when they got older. And the situation for rats is that they start to have irregular cycles around 9 to 10 months of age. And they tend to have, then to have prolonged cycles of six days or more or become, do not have a cycle at all. And we wanted to see could there be an effect on reproductive senescence in the females. And we only did that with the estrocyclicity for the for the total mixture groups, that's a lot of work actually to look at estrocyclicity in rats. And what we actually found out was that there are fewer animals with regular cycles at 100, 200, and 450 times human exposure levels, which to some extent indicate premature reproductive senescence in this female offspring. Uh, after sacrifice of these females, we looked at the ovary weight and the number of corpora lutei. And what we could see there was that they had decreased ovary weight already from 100 times expo uh, human exposure levels. There was more animals with complete absence of corpora lutei, but only at the higher doses from 200. The mean number of corpora lutei was uh, decreased and there's sort of a relationship between corporal lute and ovary weight. And sort of taken together with the data we have for estrocyclicity, this surely resembled premature ovarian insufficiency in humans, and that was seen starting from 100 times human exposure level. 
So to sort of summarize a little bit of that, what we saw, we saw both early and late effect of the developmental exposure. We saw it at uh, doses varying from 100 to 200 times human exposure levels. And actually where we saw, especially at 100 times human exposure levels, we saw it clearly was in the female offspring when they were 13 months, 12 to 13 months old. And just to tell you that this kind of late effect on reproductive functions, they are not studied in any OECD gate test guideline for regulatory purposes, where they are, you only look at their young adults until the age of approximately three months. So you could ask, is this actually a relevant uh, mixture we have made here? It, co it was composed of a sort of 20 endocrine disruptors. In practice, there were certain substances, but we sort of made some of them. We had two salates, so we gave a little bit more of them because there are actually five endocrine disrupting salates. It represents like the human exposure to 20 well-known endocrine disruption substances. And you could wonder what's the likelihood that any pregnant women is exposed to the high end of all of these substances at the same time. And maybe that is not so likely. We especially saw that when we sort of, after we just made the study. But I think that there's coming more and more data out actually showing that women that have high levels of like salates also have high levels of bisphenol A. So maybe because of lifestyle, there is actually a likelihood that women are, that the same women could be exposed to the high end. So one thing we also have to keep in mind is, well, we had something representing 20 endocrine disruptors. There are thousands of chemicals that are actually suspected to be endocrine disruptors based on in vitro activity or QSAR predictions. There are like 30 to 100,000 chemicals in without any relevant endocrine disrupting data. And of course, we don't know how many of those would be endocrine disruptors. So actually, we think that what we did with our study may actually only have looked at the tip of the iceberg. So uh, the conclusions on, on this uh, quite many years of research in rat is that we saw severe mixture effect at the nodes for the single endocrine disruptors. Also, that if you do risk assessment, one chemical at a time will underestimate the risk the cumulative risk can be predicted by dose addition. And the fact that we saw effect at 100 to 200 fold human exposure levels indicate that the margin of safety for highly exposed women is not over 100. So based on that, we find that our data indicate that highly exposed women may not be sufficiently protected already now. And I know, as Richard said, and also I think Paul clearly showed you. This is an area of high complexity and there's a lot of things we need to know. But on the other hand, I think we also have an obligation to sort of recommend to authorities what to do based on the data we have already now. Then maybe we will be clever in five, 10, or 15 years, we'll see. And uh, <clears throat> our recommendation based on that is while we get more and more data and more and more details, we would recommend the regulatory authorities actually to do something so highly exposed women will be sufficiently protected against endocrine disrupting substances. And with that, I would like to say thank you <coughs> for your attention and I will of course also thank the technical staff in my group and all the rats who have actually been used for this and colleagues, collaborators and the long list of sponsors we have. So thank you.